Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie Bree, and today I'm going to do another myth-busting type video. I'm going to break the illusion, the lies you've been told. Uh, I'm going to weed through the urban legend and give you the actual 411 on what really happened. We're talking about home arcade ports for video game consoles. Here's some things you've probably heard young Zoomers say. The TMNT port of the NES is garbage. Why does anybody like it? Mortal Kombat on the Sega CD is rubbish. Why does anybody like it? Mortal Kombat 2 on the 32X is nothing like the arcade. Why did anybody buy it? Uh, Pac-Man on the Atari 2600 was so awful that it caused the video game crash of 1983. All of these are lies. All of these are myths. These, are, these things are false. So let's kind of go through what we know. Uh, if you study video game history, you know that video games did not start with computers. I know, shocking. But the first video games were not available on home computers. Home computers didn't exist at all when video games were invented. Home computers would come out later in the decade, much later. Based on the technology that was made popular and profitable by video games so video games came first and home computers came later let's get that out of the way now the reason why i have to mention that is because a lot of modern retro gamers their experience comes from computers you know emulation steam gog etc so to them they've always had computers computers have always been there and video games have always been on computers so they've always associated video games with computers. Now, that's a whole in-depth topic I'm going to get into down the road, but all you need to know right now is video games started out as machines in bars. They were arcade machines that were put in bars for drunk people to drop quarters in to keep them in the, in the bar buying more beer. That was the original market for video games. Your first video game machines, Pong, uh, Atari Circus, uh, breakout, you know, games you've never heard of, bunches and bunches of games you've never heard of, were arcade machines. Now, simultaneously, one company uh, did produce a home console that was based on arcade technology at the time. Um, you had, uh, and I'm not going to get into the you know, Bushnell versus Bear debate. We're, gonna, we're not going to get into that. But you had Nolan Bushnell, who created Pong, and you had Ralph Bear, who created the Magnavox Odyssey. Now, technically, the Odyssey hit the market before Pong, but they were both in development at the same time. Uh, it is debatable which one was conceived first. There's... a there's a claim that Pong ripped off a Tennis for Two or Table Tennis or whatever the fuck it was called on the Odyssey. There's a reverse claim that Tennis for Two ripped off Pong. This cannot be proven. Nobody was alive back then. None of us were. Um, and none of us were in the room. What we do know is they were in development at the same time. And yes, the Odyssey hit the market technically before Pong. Like I said, they were in development at the same time. And Pong came out like two weeks later. It, it's not like months later or years later. So I want to—I have to mention that because when people say the first video game was Pong, they're true. That is true. That is accurate. That is 100% accurate. Because the Odyssey was just Pong. It was not trademark Pong. Pong was a trademark, but Pong was a table tennis game the odyssey was a table tennis game the odyssey was a pong machine it was not a home video game console if you bought a sears pong machine or you bought an atari pong machine or a coleco pong machine or a nintendo pong machine or the magnavox odyssey you bought the same goddamn machine from different companies they all did the same thing the odyssey was just a pong machine all right let's be fucking real let's give credit where due now Atari 
and Nolan Bushnell wanted to make their own version of the Odyssey. Uh, and there is some there is some contention over you know trademark and copyright infringement. So we're not saying Nolan Bushnell invented video games. We're not saying that. We're giving that credit to Ralph Baer because we've done our research and we know Ralph Baer invented Pong. And and I'm using Pong as a type as as a descriptor for a type of game, just like first person shooter is a type of game. But Atari trademarked that type of game as Pong. So when we say Pong, it's like Kleenex as a type of tissue. You know what I mean? So Pong is a type of, you know, table tennis video game is all it is. Um, so I hope that makes sense. This is important because it's worth noting that the very first home video game console was identical to the very first home uh, vi video arcade. They were identical. They were the same thing. One was called Pong. The other one was called Odyssey. But if you sat down and played Pong or Odyssey, you didn't know what you, which one you were playing. They were the same thing. You had paddles on the left and right of the screen going up and down. You had a square going back and forth and a counter at the top. It was the same fucking game. It was literally the same fucking game. Now, the Odyssey technically, technically, technically had other games, but only insofar as if you flipped a switch on the back, it just reconfigured the graphics on the screen. And so it was up to you, the user, to put an overlay on your TV to know what those different graphics were supposed to do. Because at the end of the day, it was just a square dot moving around the screen. That's all it was. So at the very beginning, at the very, very, very beginning, there was no distinction between the art, the games being released in arcades and the games being released at home. They were the same fucking game. Now fast forward a couple of years, and you have two machines that come out that revolutionize the video game industry. The first one is the underappreciated, and I will discuss this someday, Channel F by Fairchild. This one's worth noting because it was the first one to use interchangeable cartridges which we have to mention was invented by an african-american engineer uh, because he does not often get the, the 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 credit that he deserves so you can look him up there's documentaries on him go do your research however the channel f I, it had interchangeable cartridges, but it was basically the same thing as the Odyssey. The cartridges just rearranged the graphics on screen to modify the internal the games that were internally programmed. The, the information on the cartridges was not programmable ROMs. It was just like sliders that you plug that had different physical um, sliders that as you plugged it into the cartridge, it, it flipped switches inside the machine to change the programming. Still revolutionary, but not quite where where we're going. The next machine on our list was, again, made by uh, Bushnell and Atari. It was the Video Computer System, later rebranded as the, uh, the 2600. The Atari VCS, when it launched, was the first video game console with programmable interchangeable cartridges. Um... And again, when it launched, it came with variations of Pong. You know, Combat is, you know, basically a Pong game. Breakout is basically a Pong game. Atari Circus is a little bit more advanced, but primitive. And then a bunch of games that are more or less just variations of that. So it's still very primitive when it, when it released. However, arcade technology had advanced a little bit faster than the home computer technology. And what we know today as the home computer, the personal computer, came on the scene about a year or two later after the video computer system. Now, Atari has gone on record as saying they designed the VCS as a test market for home computers because they wanted to release their uh, com their family of their 8-bit family of computers, the 400 and the 800 line of computers, which they did following the release and success of the 2600, the VCS. Which the 400, for all intents and purposes, was an Atari 2600 with um, a printer connection, uh, 
a keyboard connection and a, a, a disk drive connection and a tape drive connection. So it was still a video game console dressed up like a home computer. Now, all home computers at the time, that's what they were. They were very primitive. The Apple One, um, the... Um, I don't know what 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 are some of the other ones from the time. I don't know all my computers from the time, but they were all basically the same thing. They were basically just a keyboard. All the bells and whistles and chips were built into the keyboard, and it had like outputs and inputs. So you could hook it up to a monitor. You could plug it. You could attach a printer or a disk drive or a tape drive or whatever. But the internal guts, the CPU. You know, the sound chip, if it had one, the graphics chip, if it had one, the RAM chips, if it, well, they all had RAM chips, was basically the same. They were almost more or less identical. Um, but Atari was in the arcade business first. The home computer, home video game business, they invented, they pretty much, they didn't technically invent. Odyssey came first, but they, they popularized it. They revolutionized it. They made it what it is. Um, Magnavox uh, Odyssey was a commercial failure, partially because of bad marketing. Um, and I'm going to get to the arcades here in a minute. This, this is all relevant. This is all relevant. Uh, Magnavox, um, which is the U.S. brand of Philips, uh, just so you know, Philips Norelco, um, which is housed in the Netherlands. Magnavox was their U.S. brand. Brand. Uh, they were still manufactured by Philips, but they just used the Magnavox name in America for whatever reason. They wouldn't start using the Philips name until the 90s in America. They used it elsewhere. So if you're in like Europe, you're like, wait, don't you mean the Philips Odyssey? Probably, I don't know. But I'm just I'm just going by what I do know, and what I do know is Magnavox was um, a company, uh, a, well, a brand of a company that manufactured electronics. So this is why I have to bring this up. This is a documented contributor to the failure of the Odyssey. Magnavox had TVs, Magnavox TVs, and they would eventually sell VCRs and Laserdisc players. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. And so they had stores that were selling Magnavox TVs with the Magnavox Odyssey hooked up to them trying to get you to buy an Odyssey. Now, whether bad marketing or bad salesmen or just, you know, a very confused uh, consumer base that didn't know what the fuck this thing was because they wouldn't because it was a brand new invention, were misled to believe that you had to own a Magnavox TV to use a Magnavox player, the Odyssey. So a lot of people didn't buy the Odyssey because they had RCA TVs or Zenith TVs or Sony TVs. They didn't own a Magnavox TV, so they weren't going to buy a Magnavox accessory for their TV because that's what they thought the Odyssey was. So the Odyssey was a commercial failure for Magnavox. This is well documented. But the VCS was a massive success for Atari. Now, Atari did not have the money to get into home computers like they wanted. They had the technology, they had the patents, they had the engineers, the designers, the developers, the programmers. They just didn't have the funds to manufacture, market, package, distribute, and sell a home computer. They barely were able to get the VCS out to market. Now, Nolan Bushnell took his fortune side-by-side um, side Atari because he wanted to sell more arcade machines. This is relevant because Atari's business was arcade machines. The home computers was a side hustle. It was a new business they were trying to get into. You know, a second revenue stream. But their money came from arcades. Arcade machines. So Nolan Bushnell had this uh, grand idea. Let's open a chain of pizza restaurants. We'll, we'll call it Pizza Time Theater. And we'll pack the lobby with arcade machines and kids will play video games while they're waiting for their pizza. Or breadsticks or lasagna or whatever you get at Pizza Time Theater. And he created a mascot for Pizza Time Theater known as Chuck E. Cheese. Now later the restaurant brand 
uh, would be renamed Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater, and then later they would just drop the Pizza Time Theater, and it would become Chuck E. Cheese, and then the pandemic would happen, and they would go out of business, so R.I.P. Chuck E. Cheese. But the point is, the money in the video game industry was in arcades. It wasn't in computers because the computer market didn't exist yet. And it wasn't in home consoles because the the concept of a home console was brand new and untested and hadn't been financially successful. The Channel F was a failure. Most of those Pongs were failures. The Odyssey was a failure. So the VCS was the first successful home video game product. So the home video game market as we know it didn't exist. Now, consumer expectations. 1970 whatever. Now, I wasn't there. But my mom was. She had a Pong. She had an Atari. And she played games in the bar. And so I have I have her first-hand account to go on, which is only anecdotal, but bear with me. Mm-hmm. And then other first-hand accounts I've read online in discussion groups and documentaries that I've read, books that I've read, research that I've done, discussion forums, etc. So the general consensus is the pop the general population associated video games with the arcade and they were mesmerized by oh you can get an arcade in your living room that's what they saw the vcs as an arcade in your living room not as a home computer in your living room because nobody had a concept of a home computer yet because the apple hadn't come on the apple II hadn't come on the scene yet the apple II would be the system that would revolutionize the home computer market and create the home PC market, but that hasn't happened yet. That's like another two or three years out at this point. So at this point, 1975, 1976, home computers technically exist, but it's hobbyists, nerds, who are you know, buying kits from magazines and assembling them themselves. The mass market home computer, you take a box home from Radio Shack and assemble it in your living room, hasn't happened yet okay i have to make that very clear that hasn't happened yet so the expectation is we knew as a society gamers which wasn't a thing yet but was becoming a thing had this expectation that they would go to their local bar or later video arcade because that was a brand new business that sprang up overnight and then arcade machines would be found basically everywhere from restaurants to Grocery stores to laundry mats to fucking movie theaters and bowling alleys and skating rinks and anywhere that there was a, a, a an outlet to plug an arcade machine into, there was an arcade machine. The expectation was, based on what we saw on the VCS, that home consoles were inferior to the arcade. This was known. People expected this. They accepted it. They were aware of it. They knew... The home console port was not going to be identical to the arcade game. But it was going to be what we refer to as close enough. Okay? So later you would get successful arcade games ported to the VCS. Uh, Missile Command. um, Centipede. Asteroids. Pac-Man. Later Miss Pac-Man. Cubert. Crystal Castles. The list goes on. And at the time, they were not 100% pixel for pixel arcade perfect translations. They were fairly accurate representations of the game. The gameplay was the same. The graphics were similar. They looked close enough. Now, if you look at Space Invaders, the arcade machine, and Space Invaders, the Atari 2600 game and you weren't alive in 1981 to be impressed by it, your instinct is, ew, that sucks, that's nothing like the arcade. But in 1981, or 78, or 79, whenever Space Invaders came out, I don't know, you were just happy to have Space Invaders in your living room because you didn't have to go down to the laundromat to play Space Invaders. You were just happy to have the game. Now, remember when I talked about the 8-bit Atari computer? Yeah, so Nolan, Nolan Bushnell and company would eventually get the 8-bit family of Atari computers to market, but they didn't do it on their own. They, Pizza Time Theater was costing a fortune to launch. It hadn't made its money yet. 
um, it was costing them you know, money out the ass to manufacture those arcade machines that were making money, but not enough. They put the VCS out there, and again, it was successful, but it wasn't phenomenally successful. It was making a profit, but not, you know, skyrocketing profits. It was just, you know, it was, you know, uh, it was making a profit. It was making more money than it cost to make, but it wasn't making enough money to, for them to do the things they needed to get to the computer line to market. So they sold the company to Warner Brothers or Time Warner. Well, Warner Communications, I should say, at the time. They weren't Time Warner yet, but they sold it to Warner Communications, who was a big corporation, conglomerate, we'll say, that had basically all the money in the world to invest in this new industry. And under Warner Communications, Atari was able to bring the 8-bit family of computers to market. Now, they have the benefit of coming out around the same time as the Apple I and later the Apple II. So when the Apple II took off, people took a second look at the uh, Atari 400 and later the 800 and the 800XL and then later the 1600. Basically, Atari or Apple created the market for home computers with the success of the Apple II and Commodore and IBM and Atari benefited from this by getting their products uh, in homes as well as sort of a side effect of the Apple II being a phenomenal hit. So now, 1980, 1981, the VCS is still going strong. The arcade market is still going strong. But now we have a third market, the home computer market. It is now firmly established by 1981. 81 was the year that the IBM PC entered the market. You know, DOS. Now DOS has entered the market. Microsoft has entered the game, if, if you will. So now... There is a desire to bring arcade games to home computers, just like home consoles. So again, your early computer games were arcade ports. Your early Atari 400 games, your early Apple II games, etc. were Missile Command and Pac-Man and Space Invaders and Asteroids, etc. Now because the home computers were slightly more advanced than the uh, home consoles out of necessity because the consoles had to be stripped down to the bare bones to make them affordable whereas there was some breathing room in the the computers you know there were you could upgrade the ram and the graphics chip etc in the in the 400 and the 800 etc that you couldn't in the vcs the vcs was locked it was you know it was locked it was what you get is what you get now 1979 a new player entered the market Mattel is, at this time, the biggest toy company in the world. Barbie, Hot Wheels, etc. And they see this hot new toy lighting up the sales charts. The video game console. We had Pong for a couple of years. You know, we had a blip with the Channel F and the Arcadia 1000. And then we had the VCS. So, Mattel is like, I want some of that money. And so, they got together... And they produced a machine called the Intellivision, which was basically an Atari VCS clone with a slightly more powerful CPU and slightly more powerful graphics chip, more or less. Now, design of the system, the Intellivision was very similar in design aesthetic to, you know, the VCS and its clones, but it was different enough to differentiate it. And Mattel, under the Intellivision brand, marketed the Intellivision as next-generation hardware. This is the new video game console. Prettier graphics, you know, more detailed characters, etc. More advanced gameplay. Also, at around the same time, uh, within a year or two, Magnavox said, hey, wait a minute, we have one of those things too, don't we? Let's, uh, let's, let's get back in this business. Let's try again, round two. Magnavox round two. And, you know, the level, and I'm being sarcastic, of ingenuity here and creativity, they just called it the Odyssey 2 because that's what you do. PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Xbox, let's not go down that road. <laughs> 
Xbox, you should have read the fucking memo. They're the only ones that got it wrong. Fucking Microsoft. You know, they're not good at naming shit at Microsoft. Let's just be let's just be real. But anyways, the Odyssey 2 comes on the scene. Now, here's the kicker. Here's where things shift. You already have the PC market. And PCs are all in home by a lot of amateur computer programmers who have something to prove. They want to get a game out to the world because they want to say, I can do better than Atari. I can make a game that the Atari can't. So you have this new budgeting home video programmer, this indie programmer scene, which would eventually launch a market, the PC gaming market, you know, but those, those companies were born out of the indie scene. Um, and you had, you know, game companies that had previously made, you know, pinball machines and, you know, mechanical arcade machines that were getting into the video game market. This would be Williams, Midway, Bailey, Namco, Capcom, Konami, etc. Sega, etc. And even, yes, Nintendo. They're going to come into play in a minute. So you have other companies that are getting into the manufacture and creation of arcade machines. And they're all trying to one-up each other. Which means innovation is lightning fast at this point. There was a uh, truth at the time that as soon as you bought a computer took it home, took it out of the box, it was already obsolete because a more advanced, more powerful computer was already on the way. This was true in the early 80s. The technology moved that fast. Now, it's not necessarily true today, you know, but this was where we got the computer law that, you know, technology would advance at a certain rate, you know, at a certain speed, uh, which it was at that time, you know, because it was. So now you had three players creating video games. You had the uh, arcade manufacturers, which, like I said, started out making pinball and mechanical arcade machines getting into the business following Atari's lead. And then you had the home computer video game market, which was, uh, again, following Atari and Magnavox's lead, but Atari was the leading force. You had VCS, Odyssey 2, and uh, Intellivision. And then you had the home computer market. <coughs> Which at this point was still the Wild West. It was anybody's game. You know, the ones on top at this point was Apple with their Apple II family. But Commodore was about to enter the market big with the Commodore 64. But that hasn't happened yet. But it's coming. They've already got the, the VIC-20 or the PET and the VIC-20 either on the market or you know, in development. The 64 would come later. So the com so the home computer market, they don't have the money or the resources or the team, these programmers, these individual indie programmers working from home in their, in their basements or closets or garages or whatever. They don't have that kind of money. So they're creating very different games. A lot of text-based adventure games, a lot of you know, game, you know, a lot of, like, games with maps, you know, what we would call today the, um, roguelike games were coming on the scene, and later we would get things like Ultima and Wizardry, which would help, uh, flesh out the budgeting role-playing game, which was made popular in 1974, 1975, with Dungeons and Dragons, a brand new type of game that just came on the scene. So a lot of early computer programmers who were nerds who played Dungeons and Dragons were trying to recreate it as best they could without copyright infringement Dungeons and Dragons as best they could so you had this new market this new type of game so you had developers that were making PC games we'll, we'll go ahead and give it a label arcade games and home console games um, home console games were designed in-house to replicate the gameplay of the arcade. So sometimes an arc a game would be developed with the intention that it was going to be sold and manufactured as an arcade machine. Sometimes it would be developed with the intention that, no, this one's going to be put on a cartridge and sold in Kmart and Sears, etc. for the home console. But the developers, the programmers, the designers were the same people. You had the same people making the arcade games as you did making the home console games. So even though the home console games were made using the strengths and weaknesses of the home console 
to their advantage, they were still designed to look and feel and play like arcade games. They hadn't become differentiated enough yet that the concept that we think of today as a home console game wasn't fully developed. Now, in 1983, overseas in Japan, you had a company that was making success with their 1981-released arcade machine, Donkey Kong, a Nintendo. And Nintendo wanted to make a home console port of Donkey Kong. And they did. Licensed some of it to Atari for home consoles and Coleco for computers. Coleco, a um, calculator company that wanted to get into the business. And they were also dabbling with toys, Cabbage Patch they did Cabbage Patch Kids that same year, they decided to enter the market with a machine called the ColecoVision, which is more or less a clone of the Intellivision with, again, slightly more powerful CPU, slightly better graphics, slightly more RAM, etc. Just the next gen, technically. Although, you know, if you look at Wikipedia, these three systems, even though each one is more powerful than the next, are all lumped together as one generation, but I don't like that, but that's neither here nor there. So now you had Donkey Kong on the VCS, the Intellivision, and the ColecoVision, and it was like, no, this isn't working. Um, no, I got that backwards. I think Atari had computer home rights to uh, Donkey Kong, and Coleco had home console rights, because Coleco were the ones that published and distributed Donkey Kong on the Atari 2600. It's a mess. It, it, this is a mess. You have companies making games for their competitors, and you have companies making hardware that's compatible with their competitor's software. This is, like I said, the Wild West. There were a lot of behind-the-scenes court cases, people suing each other, a lot of that legal battles going on back and forth. So, you know, things were still getting fleshed out. You know, Ralph Baer suing Bushnell because he said Pong was, you know, just a, a rip-off of Odyssey, the court saying that, no, there's no patent there. He can make Pong, whatever. You had them saying that, no, the uh, the, uh, v the VCS uses off-the-shelf parts, so the ColecoVision and Intellivision can manufacture adapters that are compatible because it's just off-the-shelf parts. There's nothing you can do about it, etc., etc. So Nintendo came on the scene in 1983 with the intention of making a home console based on the Donkey Kong arcade hardware. There, and again, they use off-the-shelf parts to save money. Their intention was to sell Donkey Kong arcade, an arcade-perfect version of Donkey Kong in the home. Now again, due to convoluted legal battles with Donkey Kong and other companies... Nintendo was not able to do this 100%, for reasons I'm not going to get into in this video. One of the levels was removed from the Donkey Kong arcade game when it was ported to the Famicom. But Nintendo didn't have an in-house development team either. They had the arcade development team, which was making arcade games. You know, Popeye, Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong uh, 3, etc. You know, Mario Brothers, which would later you know, become their flagship property as we know, but we're not there yet. Nintendo doesn't know what they're doing yet. They're just trying to figure it out like everybody else. They entered the video game market previously with some Pong clones, by the way. Nintendo was a playing card company turned toy company turned video game company. So, again, a business chasing fads. Now, Another thing happened in 1983, I've already talked about, the video game crash, and you had too many players, and too many, too much competition, too much, too much confusion in the marketplace, etc., etc. So, Warner lost a lot of money because of the crash. Coleco lost money, Apple lost money, Commodore lost money, everybody was losing money. Everyone was like, oh shit, what do we do? So, Warner sold off Atari. But they sold it in pieces. Um, one piece went to Jack Tramiel, who was doing Commodore. He helped launch the Commodore 64 in 1984, a year after the crash, which would be a successful computer, home computer, uh, uh, up to a point, the most successful home computer um, up to a point. It was, you know, very popular worldwide, mostly in Europe and in North America. 
And so the things things shifted. The other half of Atari um, got passed around like a bong at a, at a college frat party. Different companies bought it and sold it and bought it and sold it over the years. The home division, the home, you had Atari computers and then you had a, Atari games. Atari games was still making um, arcade machines. They were still trying to make arcade machines because that's where the money was. And they were still trying to make home consoles. In this time, they released the 5200 Super System, which was an, a more advanced uh, Atari VCS, and then that would get replaced by the 7800 Pro System, but due to the crash and financial troubles, that got put on hold. Uh, it was manufactured. The machines were sitting in a warehouse, and Atari was like, no, let's just wait and see what happens. And then Nintendo got impatient trying to bring the Famicom to the U.S. market, working with Atari, Due to some back backdoor deals and some shenanigans, they ended up calling that deal off because they got pissed off at Atari and Coleco over the whole Atom situation. That's a whole convoluted thing. And Nintendo brought the Famicom to the U.S. on their own using their new subsidiary, Nintendo of America, and they rebranded it as the NES. And from that point on, the rest is history. You know, Nintendo, blah, blah, blah. You know the story. However... Let's go back to arcade games. Um, video games were still arcade-centric, which meant games were... Mo the blockbusters, the AAA blockbusters, were made for the arcade and ported to computers and home consoles and everything else. But because of the crash, things got shooken up. Some of the co companies making computer games wanted to make games that looked nothing like arcades. They wanted more complex, more in-depth games that you could play for hours on end instead of for a few short minutes at a time. The home console games were still basically arcade games. No, they weren't sold in arcades, but they were arcade games for the living room is what they were. There were the, the, the computer games, you know, Wizardry, Ultima, Zork, etc., et weren't coming to home consoles. They just, the technology was wasn't there. Computers were advancing faster than consoles were. Arcades were advancing faster than computers were. So things were moving fast. Lightning fucking fast. We were getting 32-bit arcade machines at a time we were still just barely getting 8-bit home consoles and we were already getting 16-bit and 32-bit computers. So there was a lot of disconnect. At this point, your arcade was way more powerful than your home console. At this point, 1984 is the turning point. From 1984 on, you could not replicate an arcade machine on a home console faithfully. This was when we got into the arcade port. This is where it was a, it wasn't a straight conversion where we were just bringing the game over with modified graphics. This is where we were recreating the game from scratch using the arcade as the foundation. This is where we got Contra, uh, the aforementioned TMNT arcade game, Ghosts and Goblins, Gauntlet, etc. You know, Rampage. Games that looked on the surface similar to the arcade game, but only on the surface. They were no longer faithful recreations. Uh, you know, with slightly less less graphics or slightly inferior sound. And they were no longer identical gameplay either because we shifted. at uh, Up to this point, all arcades and all home consoles used the same controller, the joystick. But the Famicom and later NES changed that. Now home consoles were using a D-pad. So you had the NES and, the, and, and later on the Sega Master System using the D-pad. Well... The D-pad only has four directions, up, down, left, right. The joystick has eight directions, up, down, left, right, and then the uh, intermittent diagonals. You can't replicate that on a home console. You can't. So you have to modify the gameplay for the home console to fit the D-pad functionality while also making changes to the graphics and sound to fit the technology of the home console. This is when arcade ports no longer looked like arcade games. They were now original games 
based on the arcade. So, there was still this expectation that, yeah, the arcade and the home console versions are going to be different. However, starting with the NES and the Master System, the disconnect was growing wider and wider. You know, now, game developers sprang up overnight that were making games for the Famicom, and those some of those developers had U.S. divisions making games for the NES, and brand new companies sprang up to make games for the NES as well. Again, due to convoluted, convoluted legal problems, contracts, exclusivity deals, etc., some of those companies couldn't make games for the now-released uh, Pro System, the 7800, and the Sega Master System. So those two consoles suffered in the software library, at least in North America. That, that's important to note. Um, so game companies were getting creative. They were licensing arcade games from other companies and converting them themselves. Um, NEC, later in partnership with Hudson Soft, would do the same thing starting in 1987 with the PC Engine brought over to America as the TurboGrafx-16. Again, now you had a template for what a home console game should look like. You had Super Mario Brothers. You had, you know, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, which was an arcade port. But you had Excite Bite. You had, you know, you had The Legend of Zelda. You know, you had, you had home console games that looked nothing like computer games and looked and played nothing like arcade games. It was its own thing. And then you had games copycatting those templates, like Mega Man copycatting Mario Brothers, etc. And then you were still bringing computer games over to the NES where you could, games that were designed for the Commodore 64, which was comparable hardware to the NES. Not identical. Uh, the Commodore was more powerful and more advanced, but similar enough, you could bring Commodore 64 games to the NES, so companies were doing this. Um, now, other computers, you know, the, uh, you know, the Commodore 128, the IBM family and clones, um, the, basically, DOS 386, etc., 286, VGA, CGA, and the um, Apple II, the increasingly more advanced Apple II family, were not, you weren't really bringing those games over very accurately to the NES as well. Uh, you now, you still had companies that tried, you know, with games like Maniac Mansion and um, Carmen Sandiego. But you weren't getting things like, you know, you weren't... You, you did get Ultima, I have to mention that, and, and Wizardry. But you weren't getting some of the more advanced computer games. You know, the you know the simulations, you know, the flight sims. You weren't getting the, um, you know, the, the strategy games, the real-time turn-based strategy games. Those weren't coming over. You were getting... Um, variations of those types of games through home company, th home through the home console market, uh, mostly through like the Romance of the Three Kingdoms and the other games that that company made. But home consoles were now firmly established as its own market. Arcades were its own market, and PCs were its own market. Now, this is going to carry on into the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, the 16-bit era. For the most part. They're, you're, you're still trying to bring arcade games home with the expectation that they're not going to be identical to the arcade. Now you have the one-off, the Neo Geo, which was literally the arcade hardware in your home, playing identical games to the arcade. But the Neo Geo was hella expensive and nobody fucking bought the thing, so that's just a footnote. Starting in 1994 in Japan and 1995 everywhere else you now have the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation. You had the Sega CD and 32X get closer, but now you had an, an actual home console that was not only as powerful as what you were getting in the arcades, in a lot of ways more powerful, especially in regards to the PlayStation. Uh, now you had more advanced games in the living room. Now you could do things with PlayStation you couldn't do in the arcades. You know, very easily. Uh, so, technology caught up and now surpassed arcades. Arcades were expensive, so you had to cut costs. You had to keep the costs down. So, the technology slowed down. 
the arcade technology was no longer advancing as fast as it had been. It was still advancing, but it had slowed down. Now, home consoles caught up to and surpassed arcades. Now, Sega would continue with, you know, Capcom and Namco and Konami to advance arcade technology for a few more years um, while it was still profitable. But a lot of players got out of it by now. Nintendo had got out of it. Other companies had got out of it. They were like, no, this is, this is you know, too much money for us. We're not getting a return on our investment. So now you had, you know, later, 1996, you had the Nintendo 64, which was even more powerful than the PlayStation. So now the expectation was games were developed for home consoles and arcades were just a byproduct. They were just out there. They were still out there, but they weren't the... the, the Games weren't being made for arcades anymore. They just weren't. Now, computers had also advanced, starting with, you know, Doom, Wolfenstein, later Quake, and etc. And then really caught up again in 95 with the release of Windows 95 and the introduction of DirectX. So now you could get a more uniform home computer experience. Basically, a game could be made for DirectX... And it was just automatically compatible with all the computers. You no longer had to worry about which computer do I have, which version of the game do I buy. Because Commodore, Atari, and everybody else pretty much got out of the business altogether. Leaving Apple and Microsoft to duke it out. With Microsoft being the clear winner, and Apple just sort of limping along at this point. So computer games were getting made that didn't even take the... The arcade was no longer a factor. They they didn't even give a shit what was happening. Arcade games weren't even getting ported to computers anymore because computer games were way more advanced than anything arcades could do. So now they were turning to creating original games for the PC and how can we bring this game to PlayStation and vice versa. Creating games for PlayStation, how can we bring this to PC? Saturn was in its own world because Saturn and Sega were still in the philosophy of arcade first. The Saturn was sold and marketed as a home, an arcade in the home, uh, a virtual reality arcade in the home, based on the 3D games we were seeing, Virtua Racing, Virtua Fighter, Tekken, etc. Uh, the PlayStation was sold as a PC in the living room more or less you know it's like hey you know what you can do on pcs yeah you can do that on playstation as well they didn't even pay any attention to what was going on with home art with arcades anymore that was no longer a factor sega didn't get the memo because when they released the dreamcast again it was based on their existing arcade technology at the time to replicate their arcade games at the time house of the dead virtua fighter 3 etc which was a misstep for Sega. Again, they were in financial trouble, so what are they going to do? Cut costs where they can't. And Sega still had the arcade-first mentality where the industry and the market was like, no, no, home consoles first, PC second, video games, or I mean arcades, we don't give a shit anymore. We've already moved on. We've got PlayStation. We've got Windows 95. We don't care about arcades anymore. Now, there were still gamers who were going to the arcade, you know, out of habit, because we were, but we were starting to notice the games were not as advanced as they had been, they weren't as advancing as fast as they had been, and there was a shift in game development philosophy. Now we were getting into the ticket games. We were getting into, you know, uh, we were starting to get into the um, Cabela's and the Dance Dance Revolution and stuff like that. So, you know, the, 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 the arcade games were less interesting. Which means they weren't selling as well, and arcade companies folded. You know, now Midway, Williams, Bailey, they got out of the business, and they were like the the, the the big player. They were one of the big three. They got out of the business, and they said, nah, we're making our games for PlayStation from now on. We'll still give Nintendo a bone here or there, and we'll port our games to PC as needed. But it was basically, at this point, it was PlayStation first. And there was a PC-first mentality as well in the industry. You know, thanks to Unreal, uh, which started with Unreal and then Unreal Tournament and later developed into the Unreal Engine. 
which would become the basis for video games going forward, basically. Games would be designed using the Unreal Engine and designed to, to run on hardware that was compatible with the Un Unreal Engine, the PlayStation version of the Unreal Engine, the PC version of the Unreal Engine, the Xbox version of the Unreal Engine, etc. Arcades were no longer a factor. They were no longer, nobody cared anymore. You would still occasionally get new arcade machines from Sega and Konami, but everybody else left the business. Namco left, Capcom left, you know, Midway left. You know, there was nobody left. It was just, SNK was limping along for a while. Taito, I think, had pretty much left by this point. It was down to just Sega and Konami, nobody else. You know, a handful of players, you know, trying every once in a while to get back into it, failing, and then walking away. Um, those companies shifted to home consoles and PCs first, and arcades were no longer a factor. They were no longer part of their business model. They shut down their factories. They just were no longer making arcade machines or pinball machines in some cases because those same companies were, had been making pinball were no longer making pinball machines either, but that's a whole other story for another day because pinball is a way more fascinating, I think, uh, story than home arcade ports now let's go back to the nes the super nes the sega genesis at the time well, at the top of this video the expectation was we want games that resemble the arcade but we also want you know we want them to be tailored to the home console this is why contra has levels added to the nes port because it couldn't be a faithful port to the arcade but we can compensate by giving you levels that aren't in the arcade version. Same thing with TMNT. Same thing with Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. You're going to get bonus levels and hidden fighters and, you know, cheat codes and, you know, Easter eggs that aren't in the arcade version. You know, so you have a reason to be satisfied with the, with the home console version because graphically, it's not 100%. It's close enough that we're okay with it, but it's not identical but to compensate we now got bonus features special features extra content to make up for it you know so in the case of mortal Kombat, you have like you, you, you know the dollar code which unlocks the you know the the dip switches in the in the cheat code or the cheat screen and then you also have things like you have reptile who was in the arcade version but you also have the green sonya which was exclusive to sega genesis version uh, the Green Sonia is very hard to find. I've done it only once, and it took me several hours of trying and retrying to do it because it's hard to do. Um, but it is possible. It can be done. Same thing with Mortal Kombat 2. You had, you had the Frugality, which was an exclusive finishing move I only on the Genesis version of the game. And things like that. You had stuff like that where you had, you know, in Street Fighter 2... Uh, you had the, you know, the practice mode, which was exclusive to the home console version. So you had stuff like that. Now, again, once PlayStation came on the scene, now the, um, the video games weren't, the, the arcade versions, yes, the arcade versions were getting ported to PlayStation, but again, now it wasn't enough to have a faithful arcade port because they were identical, they were 100% identical. But we also had the expectation when we have, you have to have all this other bonus content because it's the home console version. So now, when you got a Street Fighter game on PlayStation, you didn't get a one-to-one, 100% -one, faithful conversion of the arcade. You got a 200% version of the arcade. You got the 100%, the arcade version was there, but on top of that, you got bonus content that wasn't in the arcade version. So now, the home console version was the superior version same thing with children of the atom marvel versus capcom you know x-men versus street fighter etc the arcade version is fine it's out there you can play it but the home the playstation port was the superior version it had everything identical to the arcade identical graphics levels visuals sounds characters etc plus bonus features you could only get on the home console port Sometimes the, those versions of the game would also get ported to PC. So now the expectation was, I don't just want the arcade game. I want the arcade game 100% faithful, but I also want the home 
console bonus features that I've come to expect. This gave way to what we have today, the compilation, the collection of arcade faithful ROMs using emulation to give us our faithful identical arcade ports because they're not ports anymore it's just the rom let's just collect all the roms the arcade roms using emulation so we're getting the actual the actual arcade version in the home no longer a port but it's again it's not enough to just give me mortal Kombat. give me you know um you know primal rage or nba jam you got to give me 20 games on the compilation to make it worth my while and you got to give me behind the scene footage and making of documentaries and you know trailers etc you got to give me the bonus features or i ain't buying your game and when i say i i'm referring to us the collective audience the gamer <coughs> so now the expectation was yes we have to have the arcade roms we don't just want arcade faithful ports anymore but also we still want because it's a home compilation or home console we want the compilations because, you know, value, but we also still expect the special features. So arcades are no longer where games are made. They're just sort of a footnote. Um, arcades still exist, and they're still doing fine in some respects, but it's not like it was. Nobody, nobody sits there and shows off to the gaming press, you know, IGN or GameSpot or whatever. Here's our new arcade game that's coming out in six months and there will be a home console port you know down the road no that doesn't happen what happens now is a game is made for pc or home consoles playstation xbox nintendo and then some version of that game a conversion or recreation of that game is made for arcades if it's based on an arcade property or an arcade style game like that uh, pocken tournament or mario kart uh, whatever it was called, the arcade version of Mario Kart, or whatever. Again, Nintendo did not bring Mario Kart to market by themselves. They had help from Sega and Namco, who at the time were the only ones they could go to to get an arcade machine manufactured because they were the only ones still doing it. Um, they could have worked with Konami because they were still making arcade machines, but that wouldn't have made sense because Nintendo has more of a working relationship with namco than they do konami um konami is one of those companies that doesn't really give nintendo much attention whereas namco was like yeah sure you know fine we're still friends because namco and nintendo were still friends namco and konami are um as strained acquaintances who went to the same high school but they didn't stay in touch they meet up for the reunion every once every 10 years but that's it you know konami's not out there busting down nintendo's door saying buddy remember me no they're doing their own thing and, it, and they're doing it on pc and playstation for the most part and also on xbox why did i make this video because I wanted to illustrate the shift in expectations where it was arcade first and then now arcades are more or less an afterthought. Because as time went on, the expectation went on. You know, in the early days, we wanted arcade games that were as faithful to the arcade as we could get. And then later it was when that was no longer an option, we would settle for games that were inferior to the arcade as long as we got bonus content to supplement it or take its place, you know. And then we got to the point where, yeah, home consoles are more advanced. We no longer give a shit what they're doing in the arcades anymore. Just give us Metal Gear Solid. We're good to go. Resident Evil. We're good to go. You know, Mario 64. I don't need, you know, Mar I don't need Donkey Kong arcade games anymore. I got Donkey Kong. Ar I got Donkey Kong Country. You can't do Donkey Kong Country in an arcade. It doesn't work. And no one can sell the ROM, a home console port, or the ROM of, you know, Primal Rage by itself full price. You're not going to pay $20 for Primal Rage today. You're going to pay $20 for a compilation that includes Primal Rage and 19 other games. Whereas people in 1994 would pay $150 to get a 32X just to play 
virtual fighter in the home because that was as good as you were going to get today people aren't going to do that they're like no you have to give me a virtual fighter game that does not look anything like an arcade game it's got to look and feel and play like a home console fighting game because the arcade fighting games are too by today's standards primitive for modern console sensibilities